So we switch back to the catchment scale again. Luke Critcher talking about catchment vulnerability assessments, understanding pathogen risk. All right, so there's a lot of big words in there. Basically, what I'm trying to do is talk to you about what we did at Tazwater to understand our pathogen risk in our drinking water catchments. So I'll start off by setting the scene and talking about what are some of the guiding principles that we have in the Australian drinking water guidelines, um, and then move on to the, the, the methodology we use to characterize our catchment risk and the implication that that has further down the stream in terms of our water treatment processes. Then I'll go through a couple of case studies. Uh, before I get into anything, this first slide will explain why, but I'm gonna focus only on pathogens today. It does mean that we're not looking at other things in our, in our catchments, but today we'll just focus on pathogens. And the reason why, these are some of the guiding principles from the Australian Drinking Water Guidelines. The first one is pathogenic microorganisms are the most important risk for our consumers. They're the biggest risk for them from drinking water. And the second one is we need to have robust multiple barriers that are directly linked to the, the risk posed by those pathogens. Just so we're all talking the same language, there's not, probably not a bunch of microbiologists in here, the three classes of pathogens we're worried about in drinking water are viruses, bacteria, and protozoa. Uh, viruses usually come from human sources. They're small, they're persistent in the environment, and they're very infective. Uh, bacteria are a bit bigger, but also quite small. Um, not very persistent, uh, but they're spread by birds and waterfowl. And then you have the protozoa, which are the bigger ones. Uh, very persistent in the environment, and they're also um, persistent to chemical treatment. So, Royce was right in terms of the ADWG does have quite good guideline limits for what you need to do to make it safe, but what it doesn't do is actually tell you how to quantify your pathogenic risk. So a few years ago, the Water Service Association of Australia put out a guideline, a methodology on how to achieve safe water. Um, they built that around what is called a health-based target. It's a metric that essentially means, um, it tells you what what is safe for water to be sent to our customers. I'm not gonna get into what health-based targets are. Uh, previous speakers spoke about the, the one micro daily, which is a disability adjusted life year. If you wanna read something that'll put you to sleep, we can read, we can talk about that, okay? But this is the, essentially a graphic of how the, the WASA health-based target methodology works. And um, we start on the left, which is their source water assessment. And that's really where you're quantifying your pathogen risk. Uh, there's two approaches, there's a tier one, Essentially, the difference between tier one and tier two and tier one, you're using E. coli as a surrogate for pathogen concentrations, while as in tier two, you're actually doing direct pathogen monitoring. So once you've actually determined what your pathogen risk is, you then go to the second phase and go, this is my pathogen risk. What can my treatment process do to make the water safe? And you have to assess that to see if it actually correlates back to your pathogen risk. Then you can put both of those together and say, where am I now? Am I safe or am I not? Okay, I'm not planning on you guys reading this. This is a lot of info. I know the slides will be made available, so that was just put in there so you, you can see it. Essentially, this is the first phase of the, the, the methodology. It's essentially trying to characterize what are the activities in your catchments that have potential sources of pathogens that you need to worry about. And what the, the, the WASA group did is they, they put a bin system, if you, if you want. It's four categories or four, four different catchment types, protected all the way to unprotected. And the protected catchment is something that has no human activity in it. There's no STPs, there's no on-site wastewater systems, no people recreating in the area, no stock animals. And then you go all the way down to unprotected catchments. Those have sewered areas, they have STP discharges, they may have on-site wastewater systems, and they definitely have stock, whether they're feedlots or dairies or things like that. So once you have that and you've, you've decided where you fit in that, those four categories, you then use that information and use this matrix that the, met, the methodology has and you say, on the left here, you've decided where you are, one, two, three, four. You then use your E. coli data that you've characterized from your, from your catchment and you use your highest E. coli concentration you've ever measured. And then you, it splits you into which category catchment you are. And you can see there's some anonymous and not anomalous sections here, um, which makes sense. So, I mean, if you have categorized your catchment as a category four, you're, you're seeing between zero and 20 E. coli, there's something wrong here, there's a disconnect. So you need to go back and do more work. 
same thing for the other way. If you have greater than 20,000 MPN B. coli, um, but you said, I have no pathogen risk in my catchment, it's a disconnect there that doesn't work. Um, and the green and yellow means green is a very good correlation between your, your E. coli data and your, what you've characterized your catchment, and yellow is, yeah, it works, but maybe you could do a bit more work to make sure it, it really aligns. So once you've, you've got your catchment cat category, you've quantified your risk. Um, what the guideline, what WASA, the WASA group did is they actually looked at pathogen concentrations in Australian sewage, or snot sewage, sorry, drinking water catchments, um, and also in other countries and said, well, if you're a category one type catchment, this is the concentration of pathogens you are likely to have in your drinking water. And then they developed this table that basically says, well, if you're in category one to four, this is the type of removal you need to make the water safe to meet your health-based target um, objective. So you can see in a category one, all you're basically worried about is bacteria. So you need to remove four log of bacteria from what your, your catchment has. In category four, you've got all the inputs there. So you've got viruses, you've got bacteria, you've got protozoa, and you have fairly high concentrations of those, so you need higher log removals. For those of you not familiar with log removals, one log removal is 90% removal of what you had in the influent, two log is 99, three log is 99.9, .9 and so forth. Now, um, health-based targets is not a pass-fail thing. So what the, the methodology tells us is they gave us this safety continuum. And it's a, something the water industry loves is green, amber, red. Well, they put that in the graph for us. And you see here on the right where you have your, your target is zero. So you have zero deficit in terms of log removals. That's where you want to be. That's your one micro dally that the World Health Organization is using. But if you're between zero and minus one, let's say, you're not at risk of, of an outbreak or anything like that. So you're, you're still okay. I mean, obviously the, the theory is you need to get, you're supposed to get to one. But if you're in the green section, you're okay. If you're in that yellow section or amber section up to about minus two or so, you're still not gonna be causing um, massive illness in the community, but you're in a space where you're, you have a bit more risk and you probably should be looking at uh, improving your source protection or increasing treatment. Once you get into the red zone, um, who knows what may happen. And that's where you really need to do something pretty quick in terms of improving your treatment. I hate this slide. I put it up, and I hate it every time I do. Um, people take it as gospel. These numbers are indicative of what different treatment processes can do, okay? Um, I, I put it up just to, to explain to people, we have a multi-barrier approach principle because different treatment processes are good at doing certain things and good at reducing the concentration of different types of bugs. Um, a good example of that is chlorine disinfection. Chlorine is really good at killing viruses and bacteria, but it's rubbish at killing protozoa. So if you ever, if people who swim, just watch out because chlorine does not kill a protozoa. Um, UV disinfection is kind of the opposite. It's really good at inactivating the um, protozoa and bacteria, but not so good with viruses. So that's why we use multiple treatment barriers along a train to get to our water quality objectives. So I'm just gonna go through some of the case studies we've done. Um, the first case study is for Swansea, and this was a situation where we had an existing water treatment plant and we retrospectively did our catchment risk assessment. So this is a map we, we did using um, land use data available from Depipwe basically tells us what types of activities, what is the land being used in our catchment? And what we primarily focused on, we did the whole catchment, what we primarily focused on, there's a little hashed area kind of at the southern end of there. Um, that's the inner catchment that we call, it's within two Ks of our inlet. And we, we were able to say, all right, well, you know, within two Ks of our inlet, 20% of the, the land use is grazing. 30% is reserve land or natural, uh, national Park or something like that. And that's the type of work we did. But then we also looked at um, national livestock indexes to find out who's got stock in the area and what type of concentration of stock do they have. Um, we also looked at stope, slope steepness and rain data to see how, how connected the land-based activities are with our stream, so what's coming in. 
And then we had people go on site and actually try to validate that. So you had these pictures are taken by people who were doing a catchment investigation on site. They weren't as glamorous as some of the stuff we saw early with the diving. These guys were looking for shit. Um, indication that there are animals there that have pathogens that could infect people. So with Swansea, what we did is, what were our risks? Well, there's grazing, there's sheep and cattle in the catchment. There's at least one on-site wastewater system. And if you know anything about on-site wastewater systems, you know you have no idea how effective they are. Um, and there's obviously native animals. So we have that, and we said, all right, well, that, that aligns with category t or type four type catchment. We then looked at our raw E. coli data. Well, we have 185 points of E. coli in that catchment. Our highest um, E. coli concentration was in that 20 to 20,000 or 20 to 2,000 dollar area, 2,000, <laughs> 2,000 E. coli range. Um, and that put us in that category four catchment. So once we know that, we then look at the Swansea Water Treatment Plant and say, well, what do we have there that can actually mitigate the risk of pathogens? Um, so category four, it means you need six log virus, six log, protozoa, uh, six log bacteria, and five and a half protozoa. In terms of pathogen removal, the processes that we're looking at is media filtration and chlorine disinfection at, at Swansea. So you know, you can see here, we're hitting our bacteria and our virus, credit, our objectives, but we have a shortfall in protozoa. So what we're doing is we've got a project now ahead to go ahead and install a UV disinfection unit at the site so we, that we have, um, we meet our water quality objectives. Case study two is Canara. So Canara was a bit different. We actually did our catchment risk assessments prior to building our new water treatment plant. So we had that information prior to the design. So again, we did all this work in terms of, of mapping what land uses are and then going on site and validating that information. We again, we were in a situation where we had sheep and cattle in the inner catchment. We had numerous properties within the inner catchment with probably on-site wastewater systems. We also had SDP discharges from Fingal and St. Mary's. So that there put us in that category of type four catchment. If you look at our E. coli data, we had less information in, on that, but we still had our highest concentration in that 2,000 to 20,000 range. So we knew we were straight in that category four system. So when we designed the treatment process, we took that information into account. So in terms of uh, meeting our water quality objectives, we had three processes to remove pathogens. We had membranes, we had UV disinfection, and we had chlorine. And you can see that we're meeting our water quality objectives. And in some situations, you come, you see a table like this, you're like, well, you've over-engineered that. You're getting 11 bacteria. The problem is that the treatment process is that they kind of do what they do. You don't usually buy a UV system that does one they, they usually do three or four. So what have we learned from this? Well, for us, the health-based target methodology, is, it, it's been great because it um, gives us the evidence to support our water quality objectives that we can then use to make sure we're protecting our customers' health. Um, the water quality objectives are now very easy to articulate to our, our management and our board. Uh, which makes it clearly, we can clearly define where upgrades and investment is required. Um, it's also very easy now to, to determine, you know, what type of treatment plant we need and when we don't have any. Um, and we can easily demonstrate the reduction in risk we've done by our activities. What's next? What's next? Um, we all know that, that land use in a catchment changes, so we need to keep these um, catchment assessments up to, up to date. So. We, it's a rolling kind of program. Um, and we need to upgrade and optimize the water treatment plant so that we meet these water quality objectives ongoing. Um, and we're doing that by monitoring the performance of our, of our processes, including our critical control points. And I'd like to acknowledge John Fawcett, who threw me under the bus by going to New Zealand to chase snow. Um, also, Angela Whitaker, who did a lot of the GIS work for this. Um, and two consultants, Carla Billington and Dan Deer, who did a lot of the on-site work for us. Cheers. It's a good presentation. Did you find many anomalous results in your surveys? We didn't find any anomalous results. We found a lot of them in the, the yellow area. 
the Amber area. Um, Tasmania is a bit weird where we rely a lot on run of river um, catchments. So you don't have a big storage where you get a lot of attenuation and you can control the activity around it. So you're, you're automatically almost on a run of river, a catchment three or a catchment four. Um, the E. coli data is probably more around that catchment two, catchment three. So we got a lot of yellow in that space. How are you prioritizing the um, water treatment plants with shortfalls once you find out which ones are lacking? Yep. So two, two mechanisms in doing it. One is uh, biggest bang for the buck. So the bigger the treatment plant, you might target that because it gives you the biggest benefit in terms of the number of customers that will then get safe water or safer water. I'm not saying the water is not safe. but um, the other one is the, the ones that have the biggest deficit. So we're tackling kind of the highest risk and the biggest population centers. So the, the issue with uh, using the, the old E. coli indicator as a measure of, of the water being safe is that in one of the slides I mentioned that bacteria are actually quite sensitive to chlorine and all our systems have chlorine. Um, so it's actually not a great indicator of how safe the water is. So we're moving towards a more uh, holistic real-time approach. So we're quantifying uh, our water quality objectives in terms of log removals needed across the treatment process. And we're making sure that those treatment processes are achieving that in real time by monitoring, you know, uh, filtered water turbidity, UV dose, chlorine, CTs. So we know in real time, yep, the water leaving our plant is safe. Thank you. Just, Thank you, Luke. Just 